Um, I offer you greetings on behalf of our 500,000 student athletes across the country, as well as our 1,100 uh, universities and um, colleges that make up the NCAA. I'm so proud to be here. When um, my Lyft driver was driving, I was on two phones at the same time, and then when we drove into Clean City, I'm like, oh my God, this is beautiful. So thank you so much for having me. I want to just um, spend a little time talking about um, the efforts that we're making um, at the national office and in the association around inclusive excellence since I've taken the role about 18 months ago and then open it up for like a dialogue and a conversation about what we might be able to do from the association standpoint um, to be able to be supportive of you, the work that you're doing and how we can best impact uh, our student athletes for a transformational experience. So I took the role about uh, 18 months ago, and as Merlene told you, I was at the University of Minnesota system five years uh, prior to that, and then LSU 15 years. Um, so uh, SEC and Big Ten experience sort of set me up for being able to take this role um, at the national office. And so, um, President Emmert had the infinite wisdom to uh, merge these two roles together after two people retired. So the person doing inclusion and community outreach retired, and at the same time, the HR person uh, retired. And so it's much like our Fortune 500 colleagues, right, to have inclusive excellence be at the, the apex of talent management. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's. It's hard in higher ed to merge these two roles together because it's like really competing interests. The inclusive excellence work is about coming to campuses like Clayton State to talk about how do we make our departments of athletics be places where our student athletes can thrive. So I have to be on the road out here with y'all. But then it's also the HR work that's the big internal face for the 500 employees in Indy trying to do the policy work to support the, um, the association. So it's almost like I, I, I tell my husband, I need two of me. And he's like, no, we don't. Like, no, we don't. One is more than enough. So um, upon taking the role of you know, having to merge these two areas after two folks retire, you, know, you don't just retire on your retirement date. There's sort of a slowing down effect. So there was a hunger. Uh, in the association to sort of revive and, and breathe new life. So the first um, 90 days, I just went on a listening tour about things that were, you know, going really well, things that people needed, you know, to see enhanced, things that needed to be tweaked and things that we needed to just really get our attention and our arms around. And so we came up with um, six strategic priorities that I'll, I want to share with you and pressure test because we have multiple committees in the association doing this work. And the first one is to perpetuate inclusive excellence. And what, what do I mean by that? The Department of Athletics can be a beacon for higher education about the ways in which we do this work. 40% of all student athletes in the association are people of color. 35% of all student athletes are women. And so our, our student athletes need to be in global spaces, right? where they can thrive. Our work is really to support them, um, you know, to, to excel in the classroom, in competition, to be great campus leaders, and to excel in terms of being uh, like community agents, right? To go out into the community and, and be supportive. So how do we perpetuate inclusive excellence through departments of athletics so that higher ed can come along. So I was on the academic side of the house doing this work, oftentimes being the person extending the olive branch to athletics, and now on the athletic side of the house doing that with, the, uh, with athletics, um, I mean with, that, with academics. Um, so it's, it's about making sure that our student athletes see themselves reflected in those who coach, teach, and lead them, but then it's also about how do we create these um, climates uh, where people can thrive and succeed. The second strategic priority is about building a high-performing team. So in associations, right, we are 500 people in Indianapolis trying to do great work for you so you can thrive. 
Um, and oftentimes it is an ethos of care. So we're worried about 1,100 colleges and universities and hardly ever worried about ourselves. Related to you know, performance management, related to professional development, how are we doing the complete talent cycle so people can see themselves growing in their roles so that they can be succession planned in the national office or come out to the membership like coming to Clayton State. So getting the tools that they need. Um, we have uh, about five generations in the national office, people who have been there for 45 years, right? We've celebrated someone this past cycle 45 years. And then we have Zs who are part of the gig economy who wants, they want to come for six months and then be off to the next thing. So how do you actually create a climate and a culture in that office where everybody is getting their needs met? So building a high performing organization for the very first time, that's a strategic priority. Again, as an association, it's about being outward to support you with, with little and limited um, commitment to ourselves. So I'm kind of turning the national office on its head by saying you gotta sometimes put the oxygen on yourself first before you can help other people like the airlines tell you, right? If we lose air pressure, put the oxygen on yourself first. So it's about making sure that people can see themselves growing and thriving. Um, the third strategic priority is around operational excellence. And um, this is really important because I'm merging two departments that had never really worked together before. But it's also that the fact that we are not um, retaining a whole lot of resources in the national office due to the commission on college basketball. And so many of those recommendations will take lots of resources that are not going to be funneled back into you know, the 1,100 colleges and schools. It's going to come from the resources that are sort of set aside to run the national office. And so how can we do more um, efficient work and expedited work with sort of less resources? So how can we tag team? How can we you know, figure out ways to um, align the resources such that operational excellence happens so that we're still providing goods, resources, and services to you all without expecting more resources being dumped in. Lots of Division two and three schools, also Division one, that, but those that are limited to resources, you can, you can appreciate what I'm saying about operational excellence, how you have to do so much more um, with less resources, less people power, but how do we do that effectively and efficiently? Um, I think what you would appreciate is the fact that we want to future-proof the industry. And what do I mean by that? The fourth priority is future-proofing the industry, making sure that our student-athletes um, stay close to the game. So as I talked about being at LSU and at the University of Minnesota, I often use myself as an intervention by suggesting we're not doing our level best of creating in our student athletes and others to see the sports industry, especially um, intercollegiate athletics, as a career of choice, right? So how are we going to future-proof the industry so our student athletes can see themselves reflected in those that coach, teach, and lead them? Um, we know for a fact that we have so much work to do related to diversifying the industry. And so that is our work as well. Um, I talked about the statistics around um, our student athletes being more and more diverse, yet we have 70% of all head coaches in intercollegiate athletics are white males. Almost 80% of all commissioners in our, in, in our conferences are white men. Our student athletes need to see themselves reflected. So it's about vicarious learning, right? Um, we want to be able to make sure that uh, students of color come into the industry, that women come into the industry and don't stop out. Uh, and for all sorts of reasons, we're learning that um, we have people who stop out um, because of these, um, what do we call them? We call them cultures of toughness. 
right? When you cannot survive because there's a culture of toughness, our students sometimes stop out of their sport because of it. So we don't have folks who are willing to stay on in and into the industry. So our leadership development programs are such that we want to really future-proof the industry so that we see um, folks coming in, staying in, succeeding, and getting to the CEO role. So to the head coaching jobs, to the CFO role of the, of the department, to the you know, AD roles. So some of you in here, all of you, probably have career aspirations. How are we going to succession plan you? Make sure that you're doing great work here, but then you're, you can go to your next big adventure future-proofing the industry. Um, the, the fifth strategic priority is around um, liberated external engagement. And every time I say that priority, Mark Everett says, I feel like I want to put on a beret. I said, yeah, because we all need to get engaged. Many of our communities from which we recruit our student athletes um, are limited resources. But places like Clayton State, other universities are social anchors. Right? You are social anchors for the community. So it is, upon, it, is, it is upon us to be thoughtful that we can't just go into these communities, host our championships over 72 hours, and get on out. We've got to make an impact. Is the economic impact, the way in which your student athletes are doing their service and their you know, community good so that they are you know, good corporate citizens, uh, and you're growing these global leaders. So how are we really being focused in on social anchors? Um, our, our main program is through the um, Accelerating Academic Success Program, AESP, and it is mainly for Division One. So Division Two and Three, we're trying to figure out a way to you know, really anchor you into AESP monies, but it is to amplify, um, you know, our student athletes being able to have the resources that they need on the <coughs> academic side of the house. So, um, liberated external engagement. And then finally, we want to be a national voice in work. So the good work that you're doing here in your department, we want to be able to tell that story and to suggest that when you see the NCAA, it's not just about the problems, right? It's not just about the infractions. It's just not about all of this like sort of negative media attention <coughs> that is always associated with the blue disc. But having a national voice in the work saying all of the wonderful things that athletics brings to a university and then all of the wonderful things that student athletes do once they leave campus. So when we survey all of our employers, they talk about wanting former student athletes because of all of the competencies that they get from being on teams or playing sports, the grit, the persistence, the ability to have sort of a growth mindset, you know, that they don't, they don't use stump, they don't hurdle stumbling blocks and then just sort of stop up. They just persist to, you know, like we've got to be able to figure out how to do this, um, you know, for the next time. They can work in teams, they can work alone, but it's always about how do we get sort of a winning growth mindset. So those are really our six strategic priorities that we're, you know, sort of focused on to be able to say we have a vision for the future and part of the work is coming to campuses like Clinton State to say, you know, what is it that we could be doing to support you, um, you know, as leaders, but then also to have you know a trickle down effect that actually supports our student athletes uh, in that way. Um, I'll say this: I'm, I'm here in Georgia because uh, I try to do campus visits uh, when we associate with other things. So our um, eighth annual inclusion forum is happening over at the CNN Center this weekend. It really is the premier conference um, on intercollegiate athletics and how being committed to uh, cultural enhancement and diversity is like a really real thing. So um, I'm happy to be here in Georgia, to be here on campus um, with you, but then also we'll be um, interacting with 600 of your colleagues uh, this weekend over this two-day period, uh, student athletes, um, 
coaches, athletics administrators, uh, and it's the largest um, uh, inclusion forum that we've had since we started it. So my hope is that if you're not registered, that next year that you are with us because by the 10th anniversary, I'd like to have at least a thousand people there uh, so, so that we grow in, in terms of having this um, distinctive conversation that is necessary and vital. Then students who do not compete in competition or who are not leaders on their campus or in their communities while they are in college. Why? Because you have exceptional time management. At least you try, right? You try to have exceptional time management. You work through challenges and you're able to problem solve as a team much quicker than those that don't. You have grit and resilience, right? And so that's what competition brings. And so companies that um, and, and graduate uh, institutions want to have you in their programs and as their employees because you soar so much quicker and you ascend so much faster in the career. But while you're on campus, it is our responsibility to do the right things by you, right? So when I talked about supporting folks in the classroom while you're in competition, on campus as student leaders and in your communities, it's also about hearing back and so talking back to say, what are things that we might be able to improve? So Jasmine is a SAC leader, right? Yes. SAC, SAC representative and SAC um, often comes into the national office when we convene with our board meetings four times in, uh, in the year to be able to talk about things that are concerning to student athletes and to leaders on their campus and things that are going really well that we should put more emphasis and more resources. So I want to hear a little bit of both. What's going exceptionally well at Clayton State in your, um, in your studies? in your leadership opportunities, in your competition? What are the things that we should be paying more attention to as an association so that you can thrive better? And then what are some like red hot topics that you all are talking about that sometimes don't always have a way of trickling up to us so that we know that we're in the mix with you? So um, it's not just about the NCAA as a boo disc coming into campuses when things are going wrong. It's also to learn what, what's going right. It's also to learn what can we do better? What resources do you need? Some of the SAC representatives have talked to us about issues related to mental health. We have a lot of conversations and we have a subcommittee on the ways in which we might be able to do better such that emotional wellness, um, and, and mental wellness is a part of the holistic um, way in which we are caring for each of you. Um, there, I talked earlier with um, your leadership uh, and I talked about where we are struggling around these cultures of toughness where student athletes and other leaders won't talk to advisors and coaches and academic administrators to say when you're struggling because you're worried about retaliation, you're worried about playing time, you're worried that you might have to stop out. So you don't want to say what the resources that you need. So we want to hear more about how can we do a better job around mental health. There are also other topics that I'm sure you might talk about related to resource allocation and how are we managing the resources from uh, the national office and from the association such that you get the kinds of um, um, amenities and resources that you need. You know, so many of our campuses are going to fueling stations, and Marlene, I don't know if you all are there yet, where there, there's been NCAA rule changes around, um, you know, to be able to have more to eat. I mean, I've been on some campuses where the students just talk about being hungry. And I'm from South Louisiana. We eat. 
<laughs> That's a real thing. So, you know, it just like so, it broke my heart to say, to hear our students are often hungry. And I know that you all have to consume so many more calories, especially those that are co in competition, you know, than your colleagues who are not. So, I mean, that's just two, you know, topics that some of your colleagues across the country have talked about. So I don't want to spend the time suggesting what's going well, what could we improve, but I want to hear from you. What's going well? What can we do better? You know, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take notes if, so that I might be able to bring that back. Okay? All right, and listen, I'm not, I'm not good with names, so I want to be able to remember your names because names are very important. So you got to say, every time you talk to me, you got to say your name again, okay? All right. Christoph there. Christoph. Yes. Okay. Um, as part of the SAG, we're also talking about, like you said, mental, mental health. Yes. Um, since we're all athletes, well, the majority of us, we're thinking, would, it, would, it be able, would we be able to have a mental health game, you know, how we do for breast, breast cancer, mental, mental, aware, like mental health. For awareness, yeah. Yeah. So That's it could a... be like raising awareness for mental health instead of, Oh, just one day. Right. Every sport has a game. Right. So how we do across the country where we have teamed up with the Susan B. Cohen um, National Outfit. And we have the game where people are um, adorned in pink to have this level of awareness. Because as you can only imagine, intercollegiate athletics, powerful in terms of media. Joshua will tell you. Powerful in media. And so a recommendation around a game uh, to support the awareness, raising awareness of mental health. I really like that idea. Is that a, is that a SAC recommendation that you're giving to Jasmine for the conference? Because the way in which we do this in this association is we often pilot things at the conference level. And if it goes well with the 12 or 13 schools in one conference, you will see a trickle effect where other conferences are mimicking it. So is that a recommendation for Jasmine to bring, or is that something that's already in the works? Talk to me a, a little bit about where you are in the process. Um, well, I just came from a conference yeah. in Orlando, uh -huh. and I heard that another school was doing it, yes. I think North Georgia. Yeah. And so we also were like, we could all collaborate as a conference and yeah. raise an awareness. And so I think getting to that level yeah. in the conference, but it's been talking right now. And it's yeah, talking yeah. So. And so ha ha has your coach uh, been approached? Have you approached your coach? Thank you so much, because you saw I was struggling looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> have you approached your coach about having a game or doing it as a, as a institution? Because see, that's leadership development, to be able to have this idea. And you don't always have to come up with the idea. Part of that growth mindset is seeing something else good happening somewhere else and saying, we should do that here. So, no, not yet. All right. So, Kristoff, you, got a, you, got, you have a goal. I do. You do. All right. I'm going I'm to circle back, and I'm going to ask about it. Okay. <laughs> That's a great idea, though. You want to talk about how you get, came up with the idea? How did that all come about? You want to do that? While you get the pay, yeah. <laughs> he's on it. No, but that's what I'm saying. We don't always have to reinvent the wheel, right? So some you heard it at a conference that some other institution was doing it. This will be a good way, especially if see, see taking ownership of something, not just putting the ownership in somebody else's hands. So as a, an association, we're hearing from the National SAC around higher levels of awareness and commitment to student athletes' holistic health, including mental health, but to be able to take ownership and say yes, and we're going to do a game where we are focused in on making sure that our community understands that it's just as important. It's really good. Thank you. I am Carly, but I go by Carly. Carly. All right. Um, I don't know what it's tied in because I'm a part of uh, Student Government Association. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we talked about was the support side because I'm not on the team. Yes. But 
I'm aware like of our basketball team, but I want to spread awareness towards other sports like soccer and stuff like that. But I know that we don't really have a lot of home things because we don't have a field and all that stuff. So like transportation for college students to get to the games to be able to support every sport. Because yes. I don't want to put the focus only on one sport. And I be wanting to go to other stuff, but I don't really be knowing much about it. So I don't yes. want to play the part of that. Yeah. Awareness. So to be able to to support, so you're talking about campus wide support for students to be able to get to quote away games yeah. or to wherever the games are being hosted because of transportation concerns. Yeah. Even so we did a ticket, even if we paid for a ticket or whatever, but it was like a certain range or whatever. Where yeah. Because I want to get more support out to the other sports. Yeah. I like that idea, and I think that student government could actually take the leadership on that. So when I was at LSU, um, we often struggled with students who were, you know, uh, who were not competing, getting to all sorts of games, and student, the student body, um, student government would often host um, like bus rides to other campuses in order to be able to participate in those games. So, I mean, your advisor is who? Uh, Dean Jacobs, uh, Jeff Jacobs. Dean Jacobs. Dean Jeff Jacobs. So Dean J Jeff Jacobs should, un should understand and hear from you, Carly, about your commitment to supporting your colleagues who are in competition. And then I think I have a, um, uh, a connection to Vice <laughs> President Shakir Abdullah. So Dean Jacobs should talk to Vice President Abdul about how we do that. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm gonna circle you, back now, Carly, and see what games you have you have organized transportation. Now you know what you got to get the institution ready for this because if this has never happened before, you don't want a bus with three people on it. <laughs> okay, so you got to get folks in, in excited and invigorated to be able to participate so that it can happen again. You know, so that's live work. But I like that idea. So um, it's also demonstrating a commitment to colleagues. And you don't, I mean, I think that your, your um, friends and colleagues who, do com who compete would tell you that they appreciate seeing their friends in the stands. What other things? <coughs> you got a captive audience here. <coughs> I have a uh, concern related to our careers. You talk about that the student athletes are a big assets for um, the future, like business and stuff. Yes. For international students, uh, students, the trend I've seen the past three years I've been here is that we often get our OPT and we have that for a year, but and after that, uh, most students are forced to go back to their home country. Yes. Because uh, companies have to pay for our working visa. Yes. Um, so this is more like a concern in, I don't really what, know what that should be done. Yes. But, yeah, I, I feel like something should be done if us to stay here, because America put a lot of money into getting us an education, and mm -hmm. they're giving us all these assets and stuff, but then we go home and we use that at home. Yes. You know, we're not really giving something back to the country. Yeah. Sense. So, okay, so tell, remind me of your name again. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So, so the concern is that companies um, oftentimes struggle with related related to having to pay for the work visas. Right. Right. Because if I'm in competition to another American student athlete, sure, they would have to pay for me to work for them. That's right. So of course, yes, if I'm not like better skills. Right. Then they're going to choose that. Yeah. Course. So, so here, here are a couple things, and I do want to talk careers with you because that's the one thing that I didn't ask because I was worried you wouldn't be able to remember five things, right? Because it was hard to remember four things to tell me. But what, what are career aspirations? You know, so we want to be able to get into a conversation about career aspirations. And I think um, for the sake of everyone in this room, companies are going to a much more global mindset, right? So, you know, I was in Minnesota for five years and that, that state had the most 
Fortune 500 headquarters than any place on the planet. Okay, so Fortune 500 companies, Target, Securian, Medtronic, General Mills. I mean, so our student athletes oftentimes were some of the first to be recruited, but we struggled because not all of our student athletes had a global experience. Okay, so you're talking about being able to have international students be retained in the U.S., but it's also that we've got to all be thinking much more globally than we do. So the recommendation, especially related to business, is that you want to try to find companies that respect having the global experience in their workplace. And where um, stopping out because they won't pay for a work visa um, is not anything that you really want to be a part of because that's a, a lack of respect for what a global workplace is. So again, so part of what we have to do is we have to interview these companies as well and the places where we want to go because we want to make sure that we're going to places where we can grow and thrive and be respected and appreciated. So oftentimes when I say, you know, sometimes you have to take roles um, for your for the career advancement. It might not be the best location. It might not be with the best company, but you don't have to stay long, right? It's about career progression. But for the long haul and for the most part, you want to be doing the interviewing of wherever you're going to go because you got to go there and be there more time in the week than you're actually with your, at home with your family. So I want you to be thoughtful about sort of the trend that you're seeing, that's certain companies, but most companies understand a global mindset. And so you want to be mindful that when you do the career um, fairs, you ask the recruiters about this. I'm international. I want to stay here. You've, the U.S. has um, been very good to me and, and dumped a whole lot of resources into me, and I want to figure out a way to give back. Or working visas, something that your company appreciates. That's the script that I'm on. <laughs> I mean, come on, people, that's a joke. Right? <laughs> that's the deal. I just gave you the script, you know? That's what you say. So that you are able to interview these companies while you are being recruited at the same time. But it's also a, a good point to be able to say, those of you that have not done a global experience, need to do a global experience and the start of that is to get a passport if you don't have one. Carly, that can be on your list, <coughs> sister. The student government might want to host and figure out a way to um, have passport, a passport day. Mm -hmm. So to bring folks here so that we get a, that everybody who doesn't have a passport can get a passport. And I think I know somebody by the name of Dr. Abdullah, <laughs> uh -huh. that might be one of them.